Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Oak Ridge Church of Christ. If you're, like, if you're visiting with us, we'd like you to know you're an honored guest and invite you to join us at each and every time you have the opportunity. We'll go over a list of our sick this morning. Mary Rextraw, Christy Tucker, Brenda Morgan, Keith Lebel, Lynn Coates, Larry Kennedy, Kathy Williams, Buddy Robinson, Theo Weaver, Lois Hutchison. Uh, Kenny told me a while ago that uh, to tell all the ladies that Mary Alice sent a card uh, thanking all the ladies that checked on them while they uh, had uh, while they were sick. This, so we got a card from her. Uh, on our bereaved list is the Richard Turner family and the Ernestine Hendricks family. Like to keep all of these in our prayer. Uh, a, li a list of men to serve this morning. Kenny Hutchison will have our singing this morning. Our opening prayer will be uh, Kate Franks. At the appropriate time, uh, Jimmy Hendricks will be in charge of the Lord's table. And Jason Hutchison will have our closing prayer. And Chris Bozak is filming for us this morning. I'd like to say thank you to all of these. Uh, if you'd like to give money to the ladies' fund, give your money to Karen a lot. And let's remember our cans for camp drive. That's uh, all I have to announce this morning. If you've got anything to for me to announce, give it to me and I'll announce it next week. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Ending the troubles and cares of the story land, won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there?
invitation to be one twenty four. Good morning. It's great to see you out. I, I'm glad to have you uh, here and, and with us and also those who are tuning in uh, online here in just a few minutes. We appreciate you so much your uh, continued to uh, support and uh, prayers, and we're grateful for you. Please let us know uh, if we can help in any way. And uh, It felt so good today to hear all the young folks uh, running around and enjoying themselves and being able to talk and have an opportunity to have Bible class together. I know they had a wonderful time and uh, learned a lot, and we're so grateful for each and every one of you and, and in that too. Uh, this week, uh, to me, has been kind of uh, one of those where I'm making pep talk when it comes to the way we need to be considering um, our state in life. A lot of things happened over the last few months, but it seems like this week it was kind of a piling on. Uh, you know, we a lot of things that we're seeing in the news, a lot of things that we've seen in the debates and things like that that's taking place, it, it's really, really difficult to wonder who is in control. That's what I wanted to talk to you about for just a few minutes today. I remember several years ago someone coined this phrase right here, God is my co-pilot. Y'all remember those things? They, I remember seeing them on bumper stickers. There was some had them on tags on the front of their cars. There was, there was banners. There was all kinds of sky, sign, uh, signs that said, God is my co-pilot. And perhaps some of you have used this phrase in talking with other folks. But have you ever stopped to think about what a co-pilot does? Well, he takes over when everything's going well. That's what a co-pilot does. Uh, uh, he might take over if somehow the, the pilot becomes incapacitated. And a few years ago, this song came out, Jesus take the wheel. And that's exactly what they were saying there. That I can't handle it no more. You do it. So with that in mind, let me ask a question. If God's not able to get the job done, just what is it I think I'm going to try to add to it? What could I possibly be able to do that God can't do? So it's the pilot that's in control, not the co-pilot. The pilot is the captain. And God, folks, is in control. I need to hear that. We need to preach that. It doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. It doesn't matter what's happening on a political level. It doesn't matter who's in the hen house, our house, white house, because God is still in control. Amen? God is in control. And as a faithful child of God, God is our fortress. He is our strength. He is a very help in times of trouble. I wanted us to go through a little lesson that perhaps you've heard time and time again, but I want to look at it in, in, in a way to understand this thing we need to understand together. That God is in control. I want to begin in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. And I'm going to read down to somewhere around verse 17. Just a few verses there. And, and I want us to, to, to see some things there. And the children of Israel... I'm sorry. Back up. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field and all their service where they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of which the name of one was Sifra and the other's name was Pua and he said to them, 
when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. If it be a daughter, then you shall, they shall live. But the midwives feared God, verse 17, and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, save the men and children alive. You see, Moses was going to be among those male children born. He was destined to bring God's people out of that bondage there in Egypt. But from his birth, the enemy was set on his destruction. That which the enemy had made plans to destroy, God made plans to preserve. God made plans for his glory. And what was the result of that? Do you remember that? Moses grows up in the Pharaoh's own house. And he has the very best in everything Egypt had to offer. And you know what the best part of all that is? The enemy paid the child care bill. You ever thought about that? God is in control. Let's keep digging down into the Exodus account there about Moses. You know the rest of Moses grows up and kills an Egyptian for abusing a fellow Hebrew and, and he's fleeing there. He flees over to Midian and after a certain time there uh, when he's much older he encounters the Lord there. The angel of the Lord speaking to him for that burning bush at Mount Horeb and, and he tells him to go and ask for the release of the Hebrew people from the, from the taskmasters there in Egypt. And the results and the, those, um, the plagues, all the things that come about, the Pharaoh finally submits to allow him to do so. Now fast forward to a retelling of what happens when Pharaoh lets the people go down in Exodus chapter 13. By this retelling, Moses about what's taken, by Moses about what's taking place there, God has, has him make an observation. Because he knows that his readers would probably make those same observations and pose some questions there for Moses. And so here's what, by inspiration of God, Moses tells. Verse 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God let them not through the way of the lands of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent, they see war, and they return back to Egypt. But God let the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up and, and harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Wait a minute. What is he saying here? He said, God didn't take us on the shortest route. That's important. God made him go the long way around. He made him go through the wilderness. Through rough terrain that wasn't easy to overcome. And I got to thinking about that. See, there's many times in my life and in our lives that from our perspective, there were, there's got to be an easier way. From our perspective, there's got to be a faster way. From our perspective, maybe there's a better way. Maybe a less painful way. But God's got a better viewpoint than I do. He's got a higher view. He's got a far more reaching view. He's got a more accurate view, a perfect view of the situation. I think too many times our only initiative is to just get through it. To just get over it. And too many times, God's intention is not that we just get through it, but that we grow through it. Let me tell you that again. God's intention sometimes for us is not that we just get through it, but that we grow through it. And that's exactly what they did. Chapter 14, verse 1. The Lord spake to Moses 
and said, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before uh, Bethora between, between, between Migdal and the sea over against uh, Mount Zephon, because before ye shall encamp by the sea, for Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has swallowed them up. Here all the children of Israel, by all the visible evidence, they are trapped. There's no way back. There's no way forward. They're, they're in a place where ever, nobody ever wants to be in that's stuck. They're trapped. How many times did they mumble something along those lines? Why have you led us out here to die? You shut us in. thing that we have to fight the enemy in doing is we have to fight to keep from agreeing with him. We must not agree with him. It's so easy for us to look at situations and say, oh, woe is me. Oh, woe is us. We're sunk. We're done for. And I think that's what the devil wants us to say. Because there's power in words, and he wants us to line up our, our, our place with what our circumstances is. But God wants to line up your place with his promises for us. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will make things turn out for good for my people. We got to fight to keep from agreeing with the enemy. Fear says it's over with. There's no way out. Like the westerns I used to watch. I used to hear this term a lot. Just bury me with my boots on. Y'all ever heard that one? That's kind of the way we feel sometimes, right? That's the way we get sometimes when we look at situations. That's it. It's over with. Fear says that. But fact says, faith says, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what you're going to do. But I know you're going to make this work for good to them that love the Lord. Because you're in control. That's what faith says. Down in verse 13, Moses says to the people, Fear ye not and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There's another one right there that's going to preach. Stand still and see. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. Those Egyptians that you're seeing out there today, you're never going to see them again. Maybe that's your situation right now. You tried to wait her. You cried through it. You prayed about it. You weighed through it some more. And, and it seems like you, you maybe move it past it and then turn around and there it is again. Maybe it's even worse than it was to start with. And you've done everything you know to do and you're tired. And you don't know why you are where you are. And God says, stand still. Fear not. See the salvation of the Lord. Maybe he's been waiting for you to recognize your weakness. And see his strength. You see, we'll never know his strength until we see our weakness. The, the Lord told the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, For my grace is sufficient for thee, and in my strength, is made perfect in weakness. I think back to the storms that we see where the, the disciples were there on the water. They were being tossed about in this violent sea, this violent storm. And he waited until the fourth watch of the night before he came to them in the water. And you're wondering why he waited so long? Maybe because they still had strength until that point. Maybe they wouldn't have have 
have received him the way that he came to them until all hope was lost in their head. Until they saw their weakness. Did they see his strength? Be still. Fear not. For God's in control. Verse 21. Moses, it says, stretched out his hand on the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And he made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. Here's a lesson that will change your life if you'll let's let it do it. Okay? Verse 29. The children of Israel walked on the dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. To me, here's the most awesome thing. In the middle of that Red Sea, the people of God not only walked through, they walked through without getting mud out. We'll talk about that. Not only can God bring you out, He can bring you out without having to have that baggage that you thought you were going to have. <clears throat> Well, I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those three Hebrews there. That they come through that fire, they came out of that fire, and it says that they, they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. They didn't have any burn or singed hair or clothing. I don't know what you're going to be facing today. Some of you, I do. Some of you, I can only imagine the, the depth of it. But I do know this. God's in control. Verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. This is the word of God. God is in control. And I think it's time that some of us listen to that. I think it's time that some of us turned our, our battles over to him. <clears throat> Paul and Silas were locked up in prison. Their backs were beaten. They were bleeding. They were cast into that inner prison. Their feet were held fast in stocks. They couldn't go left. They couldn't go right. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go backwards. But they knew a secret. God was in control. And so at night they prayed and they sang something. They sang praises to God. And God sent an earthquake. God released their bonds. And ultimately, a jailer in his household got on God's team because God's in control. This morning, I think it's a perfect song that has been chosen, and I appreciate so much Kenny doing that. And, and, and I didn't even have to prompt him to do it, he just did. Bring Christ your broken life has been chosen. And I think that's a good one because if we're not careful, we'll listen to what the enemy says. We'll say, well, you know what? You've gone too far. You've gone too far, and God couldn't possibly use you, and you've gone too far to ever make any changes in your life, and, and your situation is so bad that, that nobody could possibly help you. And I say to you, God is in control, and you can bring Christ that broken life. You can let God, because He can, make a difference. This morning, we're going to sing a song of encouragement for you. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting your sins, confessing his name before man, being immersed, being baptized to put on Christ. Make that decision today. If you have more questions, just please sit down with us. Let's sit down and talk through it. Let's sit down and, and let God's word be the, about what, what, what we listen to because God's word, God's obedience, obedience to God comes through understanding and obeying his word. Life is too short not to let God have your broken life. Maybe those this morning that need prayers, that need prayers for strength, that need prayers for forgiveness, come to God. Let's pray with you. Let's pray for you because we love you. It's not to stand in judgment. It's not to stand looking down our nose at anything because all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us continue to trip apart. That's the reality of who we are as people. But God, in no small way in His wisdom, put us here together. 
to love each other, to exhort each other, to to hold each other, to cry for each other, to pray for each other, to go to heaven together one day. Through that blood of Jesus Christ. If you're subject to the gospel call, won't you come as we stand together in this? Bring Christ your broken mind. So Thank you. 